afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Joanna Erdman, and I am the uh, Acting Assistant Director of the Health Law Institute. Um, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Health Law and Policy Seminar Series. Uh, this is a series that brings guest speakers to the law school um, to generate questions and conversations on contemporary issues in health law and policy. And if you're joining us for the first time, this is the second semester of our series. Um, but please check out our winter term schedule. You can find it online or you can find it posted in the hallways of the school. It looks like this. Um, we have three remaining seminars after this one. We always hold the seminars on Fridays, usually in this room at this time. And if you don't know about it, we also serve a light lunch beforehand. And you are always uh, welcome to join us for that. As well, if you missed uh, past seminars from last semester, I also encourage you to visit our website where they are recorded. All right, so this afternoon, it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter, uh, Professor Amy Bombay, who's joining us. Uh, she is a professor here at Dalhousie University and has been one since 2014 in the Department of Psychiatry and the School of Nursing. Um, Professor Brahme is a researcher who investigates factors related to well-being and mental health among uh, Indigenous people in Canada, uh, with a particular attention to uh, the relationship uh, between historical trauma uh, and contemporary stressor exposure, um, and then stress-related pathology, um, but also resilience. Um, and so, uh, in late 2015, she published, I think, quite a powerful piece of advocacy, a kind of call to action uh, on this very subject. And as you can see posted here on the screen, um, we have the privilege of engaging with Professor Bombay on a research question and issue of interest, which is historical trauma among indigenous peoples, implications for improving uh, well-being. So she'll present for approximately 45 minutes, um, and then we will open the floor for question and discussion. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Professor Monday. Good afternoon and thanks for everybody for coming today. Uh, I'm really happy to be here uh, to have a chance to talk about my research. Um, I'll just get right to it because I kind of I think I have a bit more slides in here that I have time for because uh, there's a lot of complexities around uh, indigenous well-being. So uh, I guess I'd first just like to start by um, kind of going back in time to 1996 uh, when the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples uh, was first uh, published their final report uh, regarding indig indigenous issues in Canada. And it was this report that I think really brought uh, attention to the serious um, health issues facing Indigenous peoples and the serious health disparities uh, that exist and face First Nations, Métis and Inuit communities in Canada. And so what this report, um, kind of one of their main conclusions was that tinkering with the existing programs and services and the way Canada deals with Indigenous health issues would not be enough to foster substantial improvements in, health, in the health of Indigenous peoples. And they really called for new and innovative approaches to tackling these health disparities. Um, unfortunately, um, many of these recommendations were not implemented 20 years ago. And so today, uh, about 20 years later, um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission just released their final report. And uh, unfortunately, we're looking at the exact same health disparities that we were facing 20 years ago. And uh, we know that, you know, what, 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 the, what the, the Royal Commission concluded was that what we're doing now isn't working. It still applies today. And so there's still a real need to change the way we approach health issues for Indigenous peoples in Canada. Um, this is just an example. Right now I'm preparing a report to follow up the TRC's final report um, and to just emphasize the need to really implement these, these calls to action and the costs of not implementing these ca calls to action. And um, so one of the things I was really interested in is looking at, okay, let's look at these health gaps over time and see how they've changed. And what was really surprising to me is that no one actually does this. No one actually keeps track of health disparities among the group, our indigenous population in Canada who faces the most health problems uh, in our country. And so I was kind of managed to piece together um, these kind of trends uh, 
uh, since 1996 until now. And we see that um, when we look at the all Canadians, which is represented by the light blue line, and we compare them to First Nations living on reserve, First Nations living off reserve, Métis, um, and Inuit, for the most part, uh, rates of chronic health conditions are, are growing, and these gaps between uh, these groups and relative to the general population in Canada are not narrowing. So, you know, we need to do something different. Um, if you're wondering about the low rates of Inuit um, chronic health conditions in, the gra in that graph, um, we know that they're actually exposed to a lot higher number of risk factors. So this is actually likely uh, due to the fact that maybe they're kind of dying before they reach these high prevalence levels. So, um, so you know, these all, all, all of these different Indigenous groups in Canada face very unique health issues. Um, I don't want to spend too much time just go over, going over statistics because we all know that these disparities exist. But just very quickly, uh, mental health is one issue that is uh, really important to me in my research. Um, and we actually don't know the, the, the number of health disorders faced by Indigenous peoples in Canada. But we know that levels of psychological distress are extremely higher. Uh, just from a national representative surveys, uh, we reported that about half of First Nations living uh, on reserve reported moderate or high levels of distress. And this was compared to only one third in the general Canadian population. And we see this in other Indigenous populations uh, across the world as well. I think one of the real saddest and kind of uh, most devastating manifestations of this psychological distress is uh, in the high suicide rates. Among youth in Canada, it's estimated that these rates are about seven to eight times higher relative to the general population. Uh, when we look at the prevalence of suicide ideation and attempts, uh, we found that First Nations adults on reserve, just, just under a quarter reported um, thinking about committing suicide at one point in their life and about 13% reported actually uh, having an attempt in their life. And when we compare that to the general population, the number of, of First Nations adults who actually made an attempt is actually more than the uh, proportion in the general Canadian who only considered suicide. So that's a, a big, big disparity. Um, and I just included this graph here to note that while these are national general uh, statistics, not all First Nations communities face uh, the same health issues. Um, some, some First Nations communities actually have suicide rates that are lower than the general population. So just to keep in mind uh, those, that there are there significant uh, differences between different communities. And so I think one big problem in Canada that has contributed to um, the kind of status quo and not actually changing the way we address these issues is really misunderstanding these disparities and why they exist. Um, a colleague of mine, uh, we both uh, researched the negative effects of uh, racism on Indigenous peoples in Canada, and he's reported uh, while blatant racism seems to have decreased over the last, you know, uh, 20 years, um, other types of more subtle racism are still very prevalent and one specific kind of that I think really is relevant to Indigenous peoples in Canada is what we call laissez-faire racism. And this refers to the tendency to blame Aboriginal peoples for their social inequities and to resist polities that address them. And these types of uh, attitudes are generally accompanied by inaccurate stereotypes uh, like Aboriginal peoples have so many benefits, why do they get all this special treatment, and so on. And um, this quote that I have uh, on this slide, I pulled off a news article about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, that was talking about the importance of it. And so this person shared in the response kind of uh, response section right after these articles, just get the whole thing over with and be done with it. Good Lord, what a farce. What exactly are they trying to prove? That there were some bad situations? We all know that and survivors have been paid millions for it. Say your piece, cast your check and get on with life. And so it's really, I found this quote really epitomizes the general attitudes that sometimes we face when we're trying to um, educate non-Indigenous Canadians about why these disparities exist in Canada. And um, I think the problem is generally a lack of education and awareness. And so we, uh, in some of my research, wanted to look at this and wanted to see the importance of just knowing about Canada's history and being aware of the discrimination that uh, Indigenous peoples in Canada face. And so uh, directly after the Residential School of Policy in two th Apology in 2008, 
we surveyed non-Indigenous uh, non Canadians um, about what degree they still feel that residential schools impacts uh, Aboriginal peoples. We asked about their perceptions of the prevalence of discrimination against Aboriginal peoples. We also measured uh, uh, their kind of attitudes regarding mo related to modern racism and this laissez-faire racism. Um, and then we also measured their perceived need for further government actions to help uh, improve the health of Indigenous peoples in Canada. And what we found from uh, right when the apology happened to one year later was that perce perceptions about the impacts of residential schools decreased. Uh, there was no change regarding the prevalence of discrimination against Aboriginal peoples. Um, there was no change in modern racism and that perceived need for further action actually decreased. So while we kind of were hoping that that apology would raise awareness and re uh, result in, you know, improved intergroup relations and improved support for Indigenous peoples, mm -hmm. that didn't really happen. Um, I think now it was shortly after this time period that the TRC kind of ramped up, so that may have gained more interest in this issue and kind of brought those back up. But again, it just kind of emphasizes the importance of being aware and recognizing these long-term impacts and how it uh, influences um, people's support for Indigenous peoples. Um, and again, just to note, we then uh, next kind of carried out these um, mediational analyses and we actually showed that changes in their perceptions of uh, historical trauma and discrimination against Aboriginal peoples leads to changes in these perceptions of modern racism, which in turn leads to changes in, in their support and perceived need for further government action. Um, and so I think one, uh, the, also one of the main conclusions of the recent Truth and Reconciliation Commission report, um, and this was a quote from Justice Murray Sinclair, who was the chair of the commission. Uh, he uh, was quoted saying that Canadians must acknowledge that for generations their public schools have fed them misinformation about Aboriginal people. And so, um, you know, it's, we can't put the blame on Indigenous, non-Indigenous peoples for not knowing uh, about these issues. It was not taught in our public schools, but I think now it's really evident and now is the time that we all need to take responsibility for learning about this and sharing that with other people. And so right now I'm just going to show a quick video uh, that kind of really, I think, epitomizes those attitudes. Hey Canada, I'm Lock Canoe. I know I'm not your boyfriend, but you might be your man on the side. But for this thing to work, there's five things you're going to have to stop saying about my people. First thing, alcohol. The big thing that separates us here isn't the alcohol, it's the poverty. Because when a non-native person passes out, they do it at a curly club or at a nickelback club. But when a native person does, they do it on the street. This is shameful, but also comfortable. Then there's this whole idea of get over it. You know, why don't you guys just get over it? You know what? I am over it. My dad was raped in a residential school by a nun. I'm over it. But it doesn't mean that we should forget it. Then there's the long hair thing. You know, some Aboriginal people do wear their hair long as a symbol of cultural pride. Those are the natives with beautiful, long, straight hair. Curly haired Ojibwe, such as myself, are <laughs> the greatest invention of the white man. That's the earth. Then I often hear this question. What are you guys doing with the seven billion dollars? Seven billion dollars we give Indian Affairs, what are you guys doing with it? You know what, that money has to pay for a population the same size as New Brunswick. You know what New Brunswick spends on their population? Eight billion dollars. And yet I never hear Canadians ask, hey New Brunswick! <laughs> Finally, one of your favorites, taxes. Guess what? I'm a status Indian, I pay income tax, I pay sales tax, I once even paid a land transfer tax. I want. It's all part of a much larger stereo effect that Aboriginal people in Canada are getting a free ride. 140 years after the treaties, we're still waiting for the things that we were promised in those agreements to share the land. So I ask you, who's really getting the free ride? So I'm sure you all know that's um, Wab Canoe, and uh, he's just, I think, really uh, drives that point home um, in that uh, in that little two-minute clip. And so just to reinforce, you know, it's this lack of awareness of the causes of dispar disparities that reinforces blaming Indigenous peoples and reinforces this non-support for current policies and the status quo.
And so what uh, non-Indigenous Canadians often aren't, and, and also Indigenous Canadians, I myself wasn't taught this growing up in high school. Uh, and it wasn't until uh, I started learning about this just through exploring my own personal family that I really became kind of angry and uh, really wanted to do something with my research to address this. And so what, what a lot of Canadians don't know is uh, about the discriminatory policies enshrined in the Indian Act, the residential school system, the 60s scoop, and that the roots of these dis disputes that we see on TV over land, resources, and cultural rights, uh, including healthcare rights, often date back for many decades. And, and you know, most of us watching this don't really understand um, the history relating to this. And instead, we're exposed to just kind of uh, Indigenous peoples facing off against non-Indigenous indigenous peoples without really understanding why. Um, and this is a quote from Phil Fontaine, who is a former national chief, who was the first one to really come out uh, with his own personal experience of abuse at residential schools. And he described that many non-Aboriginal people see these incidents as tragic but isolated incidents, whereas Aboriginal people, in contrast, see these incidents in the context of a historical pattern of state behaviour. And so unfortunately, we see these same kind of discourses um, in the healthcare system. And research have, has shown that, ex that encountering discrimination in the, in the healthcare system actually has uh, the worst effects compared to encountering it in any other context. Uh, and just to give you an example, um, this is, these are quotes from a study that was done in Winnipeg. Uh, one healthcare provider in Winnipeg um, responded to their questions saying, it's interesting you're just targeting the native population because my first thought, first thought, to be honest with you, was that here we go, we're going to do more for the Aboriginals again. What about doing it across the board for everyone? Why do we have to target these people so much? So that's kind of this notion of uh, egalitarianism. Why can't we just treat everybody the same? But what they're not taking into account is the complex history and the effects of historical trauma, which I'm uh, about to get to in a second. Um, another kind of common um, discourse that we see in healthcare, uh, in healthcare contexts uh, is a healthcare provider saying that it comes down to personal choices. If unfortunately some of them are going to be prone to alcohol abuse and drug addiction because it is in their genetic makeup from birth, at some point there comes a time that they're responsible for where they're at. So as I said, you can provide all the stuff in the world, yet they're not able to access it because they just can't or they uh, do not want to for whatever reason. So obviously, um, encountering uh, these uh, attitudes in the healthcare system is really not going to uh, encourage Indigenous peoples to come for help. Um, we know that um, lack of trust and past discrimination does lead to the, to the avoidance of, uh, me of <laughs> mental health services and health services in general. We know that blatant uh, uh, discrimination does exist in Canada. Um, there is a lot of research showing just the, you know, uh, reinforcing the main general stereotype about Indigenous peoples as uh, being, uh, as having substance abuse problems. And uh, I think one of the worst uh, case examples of this was in 2014 when uh, Brian Sinclair was in the Winnipeg hospital uh, and he was in a wheelchair and he was, it was just assumed that he was drunk and he, end, and he wasn't and he ended up dying um, after waiting 34 hours in that uh, hospital. And if you go on this link, uh, which I'm not gonna do now, you can actually see this and see their weight and how, um, how just terrible it is and that we really have to do something to, to stop this. And so, um, so not only do we see this in healthcare contexts by healthcare providers, but you know, we, people who are making decisions on, on policies for Indigenous peoples uh, still need to be educated. Um, just last year, um, when there was a lot of uh, emphasis on uh, having an inquiry for the missing and murdered Aboriginal women, um, our Prime Minister, uh, ignoring all of the rep scientific reports that had been done and showing uh, that this is linked to colonization. Um, he made the statement that this is actually not a sociological phenomenon, but a criminal uh, phenomenon. So again, this lack of understanding and lack of acknowledging the long-term effects of colonization. And so um, that's where, um, if you're, in case you're wondering what historical trauma actually means, 
Um, it refers to a concept that has been put forward by um, Indigenous scholars, researchers, and has been really supported by Indigenous communities uh, in North America and worldwide. And it's been defined as the cumulative emotional and psychological wounding over the lifespan and across generations emanating from mass group trauma. Um, and it has been described by Joe Gahn, who is an Indigenous psychologist in the U.S., as a counterbalance to the increasing prevalence of biological explanations for mental health problems. Historical trauma accentuates and implicates the processes of colonization rather than faulty genes or broken brains as fundamentally causal in the origins of epidemic levels of distress that afflict too many First Nations communities. Mm -hmm. So um, it was when I was starting my graduate work that I came across this idea and it really uh, spoke to me in, in, in helping me reflecting on my family's experience of why, you know, why I see some of the dysfunction and problems in my family that I, that I do. And so it really helped me understand this. But then in the literature there was also some um, critique of this concept in showing well uh, and, and a lot of kind of doubting of this concept showing well there's no evidence that there's no we can't really prove that this exists so it's not really a useful um, concept and so that's uh, where I really wanted to step in and try to provide support for this concept. And specifically um, because my family had been affected by residential schools that's what I really wanted to talk about. So. Um, I think most of us here know already, but just to, in case, the Indian residential school system um, ran in Canada from the mid-1800s until the last school closed in 1996. Uh, during this time, Indigenous children were forcibly removed from their families and forced to live and attend uh, residential schools. And prisons were, uh, sorry, parents were actually threatened with imprisonment if they tried to keep their children at home. Uh, we know now, and if you can, you could read this in the TRC report, um, many of these uh, students experienced various types of abuse. Uh, neglect was uh, pervasive, and we were still finding about more of the abuses that have happened in that school, in those schools. Um, research has shown that survivors, so those who attended these schools, are more likely to suffer from various physical and mental health problems compared to those who did not attend. Uh, we've reported that those who attended uh, are more likely to report psychological distress compared to Indigenous adults who did not attend. And we've also reported that um, survivors are more likely to experience various physical health conditions as well. So what I've been really interested in looking at is not only the, how these schools continue to affect those who attended, but really those who uh, affect the intergenerational survivors, so the children and grandchildren of those who attended. And so um, first here, this is um, the proportion of the non-Indigenous population who reported moderate or high psychological distress, and that's from a national uh, sample of Canadians. Um, and then when I compare, we compare that to, uh, from another sample of First Nations adults on reserve. So all of these uh, graphs or bars represent First Nations people. And we found that First Nations adults whose families had not been affected by residential schools, uh, about 40% reported this moderate or high distress levels, which was significantly higher than the non-Indigenous population, but lower than the First Nations adult population who had been affected by residential schools. We found that survivors, about 55% reported high or, high or moderate psychological distress. Those who had at least one parent who attended uh, reported uh, similar levels, and those who had at least one grandparent who uh, att attended reported similar levels. So again, really, uh, the intergenerational effects seem to be, in terms of distress, just as strong as uh, compared to having attended themselves. Um, and then this uh, was a paper that we published this finding in uh, just in 2014. And this was the paper that really uh, provided evidence for the cumulative effects of residential schools across generations. So really supporting this notion of historical trauma. Um, we compared uh, First Nations adults whose families had not been affected by residential schools. Again, they had the lowest levels of psychological distress. We compared them to adults who had a parent or a grandparent who attended, so one previous generation. They had significantly uh, greater likelihood of reporting higher levels of psychological distress. And then lastly, we compared them to those who had a parent and a grandparent who attended, so two previous generations. And again, we found this increased risk for psychological distress, so really showing this linear uh, relationship, showing the more effects of the more generations in your family that have attended, the greater the risk. Uh, 
Um, and so then we were also really interested in just kind of looking at the various pathways that were involved in the transmission of trauma um, across generations. And uh, we were really interested first in looking at um, adverse childhood experiences because that was one of the most obvious um, effects of, of residential schools was that survivors experienced uh, extreme trauma and neglect. Um, and so we would expect that the ability for them to provide a good uh, environment for their own children would be, would be difficult because they're facing mental health problems. Um, they didn't receive a good education and all of these things. And so that is what we wanted to look at and, and that's what we found. We found that um, having a parent who went to residential school, so now none of these people went to residential schools themselves, uh, but having a parent who went to residential school was associated with a greater likelihood of experiencing various types of childhood adversities, uh, including not only abuse, but various types of neglect, like um, emotional neglect, physical neglect, as well as a greater likelihood of um, various indices of household dysfunction, like having a parent who abuses substances or having a parent um, with a mental health issue. Um, so in turn, uh, we found that the greater risk of these childhood adversities put these same individuals at a greater risk for encountering more stressors and trauma in their adulthood. So there we found that uh, residential school, parental residential school attendance was linked to greater childhood adversity, which in turn put them at risk for more adult traumas and more perceived discrimination in adulthood. And in turn, those accounted for their increased risk for depressive symptoms compared to those who did not attend. So, um, not only did we found, find that those with a par whose parents went to residential school were more exposed to uh, a greater number of stressors, we also found that they were more, more vulnerable to the negative effects of these stressors. Um, and so here we showed uh, that among those with at least one parent who went to residential school, so that's with the solid line, uh, the relationship between uh, childhood adversities and depressive symptoms was much stronger. As you can see, the, the slope of that line is much higher. And so those without this family history of residential schools, um, they were less affected by these childhood adversities. And we found the same patterns in relation to adulthood traumas and relation to the negative effects of perceived discrimination. And just to give you an idea of the proportion of the population that has been affected by residential schools, so you can get a, uh, an idea, um, these we, we just finished doing, uh, pulling these statistics from national data sets, again, of the First Nations population living on reserve. And so we found that um, from 2002 to 2003 until uh, just last year, the proportion of adults reporting to be survivors has remained pretty steady, which is surprising because we would expect that survivors would have decreased, and that probably is the reality. Uh, and just probably my guess is that survivors not all said that they went to residential school at that time, because at that time there was still a lot of silence surrounding residential schools. But uh, again, looking at just the intergenerational survivors with a parent or a grandparent, we see that the proportion of, of these individuals is still remains very high in, in, on reserve. So uh, in some communities that have been affected by residential schools, you know, at least half have been affected by residential schools. And we know, and now that we know this increased risk, it's not surprising that these disparities exist. Um, so, other uh, of my colleagues, for example, Melissa Walls and Les Whitbeck, have shown the intergenerational effects of uh, uh, collective traumas aside from residential schools. So they specifically looked at forced relocation and showed similar intergenerational effects. And um, one thing, another issue that has been uh, talked about over the years um, by researchers, and uh, many of these researchers have argued that the child welfare system through its large scale removal of Aboriginal children from their families, culture and communities be considered a continuation of the policies of forced assimilation of the residential school system. And so what we're talking about here is um, following the Indian residential school system uh, as it was kind of widening down, the child welfare system was kind of ramping up in their removals of Indigenous children from their home. So it kind of just kind of started doing the same thing in a di with a different mechanism. Um, and so we were really interested in exploring this kind of long-standing long hypothesis and we explored 
whether there's a statistical link between the intergenerational effects of residential schools and the likely to, likelihood of spending time in foster care. Uh, and so we actually did find support for this. And again, we looked at the number of generations in one's family affected, and that was associated with an increased likelihood of spending time in the child welfare system. We were also interested in looking at what are the factors that are involved in this greater risk. And uh, we looked at both just general childhood stability in the home while growing up, and we looked at self-reported childhood economic stability. And what we found it was, was that it was the economic stability in the, in the family that really accounted for this relationship. And that it was really this economic stability that would happen first and that it would lead to uh, the, the lack of ability of parents to provide care for their families. So they're coming out of residential school with a lot of health problems, mental health problems, not a lot of education. Uh, of course, they're not going to be able to provide a, a good economic home for their children and in turn, they can't just provide a general stable home. And that has uh, contributed to this intergenerational cycle of <coughs> children being removed from their families and uh, continued childhood adversity over the generations. Um, and this is just to point out that right now there is a, um, a human rights tribunal going on about the issue of child welfare. Um, we know right now that approximately 50% of First Nations children under the age of, sorry, 50% of children under the age of 14 that are in child welfare are Indigenous, which is a very staggering percentage. And it's argued that, and what the uh, Assembly of First Nations argued in this Human Rights Tribunal is that, um, that the very point that it's the past historical uh, policies that have led to the continued continuation of uh, removal from, uh, of children from, these, from their homes. And what our research has really supported them in saying is that um, despite, uh, is that despite um, all of these historical things that have happened and the now current health disparities, um, the point they're really trying to make is that ch child welfare is still underfunded. So despite all of these um, these health gaps that currently exist, um, they're not getting funded as much. Um, and, and that's despite this common myth that we have in Canada that Indigenous peoples get all of these extra benefits, when in reality, on a reserve, a lot of these services are underfunded. Um, and so this is uh, a report prepared by the First Nations and Child and Family Caring Society, which is the group that uh, are taking the Canadian government uh, and accusing them of discrimination against Indigenous kids. And so their report has shown that uh, federal funding for First Nations child welfare was 22% less than provincial funding levels, uh, yet First Nations social workers in many regions have a higher caseload than their provincial counterparts, yet are required to do more work with fewer resources. And then this also applies to other areas including education and health services. And so um, this uh, decision of this tribunal is might have very big implications for not only child welfare but for education and health services on reserve as as well. And so now um, I'd just like to move on and talk a little bit about um, the TRC calls to action and so what and about what now what do we do now to help close these gaps and to reduce these disparities and so one of the calls of the TRC um, calls to action was to close these health gaps so how do we do that um, again this is just to reinforce this is a uh, diabetes rates um, and showing that diabetes is one of those disorders that the gap has actually increased over time um, and so that's just to point out that in some of these cases, gaps are actually widening. And these gaps are even more important to address because we know that the Indigenous population in Canada uh, is growing at a faster rate compared to the non-Indigenous population. And we also know that uh, they're younger uh, compared to the non-Indigenous population. And so um, when we consider the, um, the differences in the ages, uh, and age standardized, it, the gaps actually um, are underestimated. So, so again, these gaps that I've shown in these, um, in these graphs are actually an underestimate, and we don't actually have uh, 
uh, clear uh, idea of the prevalence, which is something um, that we also have to start doing. And that was one of the official calls of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission as well. And so to start to decrease uh, these gaps, which would result in, I think, if people aren't convinced by the moral arguments of decreasing health disparities, I think another argument that we could put forth is the economic costs of these disparities. And, um, and so to decrease economic costs, we know that we have to reduce the number of people developing these health uh, conditions, and we know that the health gaps are accounting for a significant proportion of these costs. And so closing these gaps will require um, according to the TRC, holistic strategies addressing social and cultural determinants of health and the implementation of the TRC calls to action related to welfare, child welfare, education, language and culture and justice. And we also need more preventative um, holistic approaches that really address all of these social and cultural determinants of health, which, health, which was one of the uh, you know, main suggestions that was put forth 20 years ago in the Royal Commission report. And uh, we would expect that this would actually result in cost savings over time. And this is important because um, in Canada, we know that the costs of our healthcare system is increasing. This is just the co increasing costs uh, of all Canadians over time. Um, this is the estimated, so, so this is the estimated uh, increase into 2020 of diabetes. So if we just keep going with the status quo, it's estimated that uh, these rates are going to keep increasing. And uh, again, just emphasizing uh, the importance. And so again, not surprisingly, we know that Health Canada spending on First Nations and Inuit healthcare has also just been continuing to increase as rates of chronic health conditions increase. And so, um, so to start, uh, some of the other health-specific calls to action uh, put forth by the TRC include uh, establishing me measurable goals to identify the health gaps and publishing annual progress reports and assessing long-term trends. So that's one thing I'm starting to try to do myself right now. Um, and just the fact that we haven't been doing that up until now is pretty crazy. Um, we know that the lack of comprehensive quality data on the health of Indigenous peoples inhibits the production of research to identify, develop and monitor strategies for addressing the gaps in health outcomes. And it's, it's pretty crazy that there's just no systematic assessment or reporting of these long-term health conditions uh, among Indigenous peoples in Canada. Uh, the TRC has also called uh, for the federal, provincial and territorial governments to recognize and implement the health care rights of Aboriginal peoples as identified in international law, constitutional law and under the treaties. And it's also been called uh, to address the jurisdictional disputes concerning Aboriginal people who do not reside on reserves. We call on the federal government to recognize, respect and address the distinct health needs of the Métis, Inuit and off-reserve Aboriginal peoples. So this is a bit of a wordy slide and that's because um, this is not my um, specialty and a lot of this information I got from Constance McIntosh. So, um, but I thought because this is uh, the law uh, seminar that this would be of interest. Um, and so when we're talking about health care rights, uh, in international law we're talking about the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And uh, just generally, numerous articles within this document pertain directly to the health rights and guarantee Indigenous control over, over health. When we're talking about constitutional law, um, Scholars have argued that healing and health practices were integral to Indigenous societies pre-contact and should thus be protected under constitutional law. Um, and recent cases um, have found that an Indigenous woman who had a constitutional protected right to treat her daughter according to Indigenous healing practices um, rather than through the Canadian health care system. Um, and finally, um, fiduciary law, legal scholars suggest that the state's obligation to Indigenous peoples is also a basis for the federal government's responsibility to provide health services. But um, when we, according to the federal government, um, they assert that um, uh, they assert that their provision of services is on a humanitarian basis. Um, 
and they kind of deny, continue to deny that there's a constitutional treaty or other legal basis for the provision of such services. Um, the federal government maintains that provinces and territories have an obligation to provide health services uh, mandated in the Canada Health Act, both on and off reserve. And in general, First Nations agree, and this is the kind of the treaty rights that they're really fighting to get recognized. Uh, and I think there is a little bit hope with our new government um, and some of the some of the steps that they've already taken. Um, but just to to give you some updates, previous course decisions in Saskatchewan have denied that treaty rights include an obligation to provide health care. Uh, but current legal principles for treaty interpretation have found that those earlier cases uh, were not correct and um, suggest that new challenges would be decided in favor of the existence of treaty rights to health care. So I think in general this is ki this, these kind of arguments are moving in the right direction, I think. <laughs> Uh, regarding jurisdictional di disputes, um, we know that this has led to, this is part of the reason that has led to the significant underfunding of some services on reserve and ambiguities over pro pro provincial responsibilities uh, remain. And most provinces and territorial health, mi health ministries interpret their obligation to provide services uh, to First Nations in different ways and and so one of the a very kind of simple conclusion of one of the working groups that have been working specifically on these jurisdictional issues is by clarifying jurisdictional responsibilities and in eliminating the underfunding identified in individual case, cases governments can prevent d denials delays and disruptions in services so some very I think uh, evident things need to happen to to stop these uh, jurisdictional issues from co continuing. And this is just a list of um, some of the gaps or disparities in the access to health services on reserve um, that are associated with these jurisdictional disputes. And there's just a whole bunch that I won't go over. <laughs> Um, and so these jurisdictional d disputes, you know, they all also affect uh, First Nations peoples living off reserve. Um, there's very, it's very complicated to know as a First Nations per person uh, if your status, if your non-status, what um, serv special services you're avail is available to you. And generally off reserve, there's huge gaps in Indigenous specific and culturally relevant programming uh, that are, uh, we know are needed to address uh, these health issues. Um, right now I'm working at the Friendship Center in Halifax and they've identified mental health issues as one of their main issues and they have no, um, they, have no they have no mental health workers. That's one of the main uh, things that they need and there's just no support uh, in the city for them to do that. Um, so some of the last uh, TRC calls to action that I just want to go over is um, the requirement of improved and equitable access to preferred and culturally safe and effective health care and health promotion. And these are going to need a, a number of things that have been called for, uh, including addressing the distinct health needs of Métis, Inuit and off-reserve populations and recognizing the value of Aboriginal healing practices and using them in the treatment of Aboriginal patients uh, in collaboration with Aboriginal healers and elders. Uh, and I think you know there are a lot of good examples across Canada where this is actually happening but it's, um, it's all too few and far between and this needs to become more of a regular, a regular practice. Uh, there's a call for all levels of government to increase the number of Aboriginal health professionals working in the healthcare field and ensure their retention in the healthcare field, as well to provide cultural competency for all healthcare professionals and for medical schools and nursing schools in Canada to require all students to take a course dealing with Aboriginal health issues. And again, this is something I think that some institutions have started, but we have a long way to go, um, including here at Dalhousie and uh, in, in the Atlantic region. So one of the, uh, the last health-related calls to action um, was calling on the federal government to provide sustainable funding for existing and new Aboriginal healing centres to address the physical, mental, emotional and spiritual harms caused by residential schools. And again, I guess I haven't even mentioned this yet, uh, I have this similar um, recommendation that was uh, recommended 20 years ago. And so in all of these instances, the exact same recommendations had been uh, put forward in the RCAP report. <laughs> 
And so um, just emphasizing the importance of healing uh, and healing from historical trauma that has uh, he, he, the, the term healing in, in health in Indigenous peoples kind of grew as this notion of historical trauma has grown. And so um, healing is really often described as a journey and an ongoing process for Indigenous peoples. Um, we know that approaches to wellness that draw upon Indigenous healing practice are often more effective in responding to the health needs of communities. And research undertaken by the Aboriginal Healing Foundation, which is uh, one of the organizations that uh, really provided funding for all of these community-based healing projects that happened from about 2002 till about 2013. Um, and so they did an analysis and an evaluation of all of these projects and concluded that um, the, the services that were being most asked for and that were most in demand uh, were those looking to work with elders, do traditional ceremonies, and that they found those services to be most critical to their health. And so this is just a graph that, that we've done showing the number of these healing centers over time. Um, so in, I mentioned it was in about 2000 when they, the, they provided funding for these healing centers and in about 2007 and 2008 when the healing was cut and so now there's only about five or six of these healing centers in Canada. And when we look at, at the proportion of adults who have been affected by residential schools and we see that that hasn't uh, decreased in the same way, we see that it doesn't really make sense that this funding has come and gone because these problems still exist and still need to be addressed. So just to emphasize this continued need for these healing centers, um, uh, one of the main points from their evaluation that they did was at the height of the Healing Foundation when they had the most projects running, only 11% of their service providers reported feeling confident that they were reaching individuals in their community who had the greatest need for these programs. So at the height, when most of these programs were actually running, they were only, uh, you know, really getting to a small proportion who, who needed the help. Um, the Healing Foundation found that approximately 36% of funding uh, funded healing initiatives had waiting lists and program staff stated that many of those affected uh, were not able to receive care. And so I think there's no reason to think that this uh, extensive need for care has decreased. We would, uh, ex but we do know that the funding for, for these supports have decreased. And so just to emphasize, um, kind of ending on a good note and emphasizing the power of learning about uh, historical trauma and learning about history not only for non-indigenous peoples but for Aboriginal people as well. In a lot of our research we um, ask people about when, when did you find out about your family history and a lot of them report uh, only having learned about residential schools and their parents and families experience in the last five to ten years. Uh, and this is just an example of one of uh, the quotes from our participants. I found out when I was 27 that my father attended residential school. My sister told me. My father has never spoken to me about it. I read his court statements without his knowledge and this is where I learned about the sexual, physical, emotional and cultural abuse he endured. I was deeply saddened but it gave me an understanding of why my father behaves the way he does. It helped me understand the cycle of abuse because in turn he abused my mother and I. He learned these behaviors in residential school and could not cope so he turned to alcohol and so did I. But at the moment I'm in treatment and am dealing with these issues, I can break the cycle. And so we found that learning about historical trauma really fosters this sense of empowerment and it really is kind of that aha moment for some Indigenous peoples whose families have still not healed and have still not found a way to openly talk about these issues. Um, another thing I'd just like to end on is um, you know, I, a lot of my presentations I focused on uh, the trauma, but I'd also like to emphasize that despite all of the things that have happened to Indigenous peoples, uh, the fact that they're still, we're, we're still here and are, um, I think, on turning a corner right now really speaks to the resilience of Indigenous peoples. Um, this is another quote, quote shared by one of our participants. I was ashamed growing up, but I've since reclaimed my identity. Now that I'm on my own, I have more pride and I'm learning to love my identity. I gave my son a traditional Ojibwe name and I vow to raise him to be proud of who he is. And our quantitative research really supports these 
uh, ideas of the importance of cultural identity, the importance of cultural pride, and the, and the importance of learning about history and, and culture. Uh, we found that uh, First Nations adults, um, we found a strong relationship between perceived discrimination and depressive symptoms. But we looked at what we call in-group effect, which is really just cultural pride. We found that those who were high in cultural pride were really protected against the negative effects of discrimination. And that those who were lacking in this cultural pride were the ones who were really uh, negatively affected by perceived discrimination. You know, showing that cultural pride can act as a buffer. And so, um, just to emphasize that uh, I think we need to recognize and, and raise awareness about the long-term impacts of historical trauma, but also um, raise awareness about the resilience, the importance of um, cultural pride and, um, and, and, and reconciliation and for non-Indigenous and Indigenous peoples to both uh, come together and celebrate uh, Indigenous peoples in Canada. So thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, and feel free to email me if you have any questions as well. Thank you. You know, the ultimate um, goal, ac according to treaties, and is for Indigenous people to um, to take control of their own health service. Is that kind of what you're wondering about? Is their own they, control? They, they, they want to use their Indigenous healing services. Uh -huh. That's one one argument or one request okay. regarding human rights. And the other one is the right to, to use or to enjoy the Canadian health. Okay. Service. So so what we're arguing is that. Indigenous people should be able to seek out and, 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 and acquire their cultural healing services within the mainstream system. And that's what we are, uh, you know, kind of hoping for, is that mainstream practitioners can become more aware of the needs of Indigenous, uh, indigenous peoples and, and be at least be aware of where they, to s where they can send them to get those or, yeah. and start to, to bring that into the mainstream systems. Healing centers sound wonderful, and mm -hmm. I, I wish they existed for everybody, not only for Aboriginal. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Have you come across any work that like that involuntary psychiatric commitment amongst Aboriginal populations, mm -hmm. or is there no data on that? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, I have not come across any literature that has looked at that, uh, but. If you're thinking about it, it'd probably be good something to look into. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not more help. Yes. Thanks, Amy. That was an excellent presentation. Um, I'm with the Aboriginal Children's Church and Healing Initiative. Uh, it's a research initiative that we had in the And um, we're certainly learning that Aboriginal children were. Sorry, could you just speak up a little? Yeah. We can't quite hear you on this side of the room. Sure. Um, we're learning that Aboriginal kids uh, today are certainly affected uh, by the residential school experience because they've learned how to uh, express their pain from their grandparents um, mm -hmm. who 
sort of learn from a cultural perspective to be brave, but also be stoic in the schools to not show their painting. And so I'm just wondering, um, in your 2011 study, you said about the adverse childhood experiences, what would they have been? Can you describe those? Yeah, so we, we measured 10 specific adverse childhood experiences, and that score was cumulative. Uh, whenever they were exposed to a different one, they got a point. So the more adversities they're exposed to, the, the higher the score. And so we looked at uh, physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, um, ne physical neglect and emotional neglect, um, having a parent, uh, growing up in a household where there's domestic violence, growing up in a household where a parent abused substances, growing up in a household where there was someone who was involved in the criminal justice system. And then there were two others that I can't recall offhand. <laughs> yeah, but that's really interesting and, and, and makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, just relation, you know, just it's kind of related to some of the work we've done looking at the intergenerational effects of just communication in general. We find um, those whose parents went to resident, to went to residential school, um, don't, those families don't have a, a, a good sense of communication within the family. And I think it kind of somewhat might be related to that, you know, don't express yourself, don't express your feelings, don't express how you're feeling, just be good type of thing, yeah. Yes? I'm a social work student and I've just been thinking a lot about the child welfare system and the like shocking rates of children being taken out of their homes and because people are saying that there are more kids being removed by child welfare now than we're in residential schools. So in a way it's like it's almost we're in a, there's a lot of people who think it's a historical trauma, but it's like it's an ongoing current right. trauma. And I'm wondering what I don't know, I, it feels to me like social workers are being put in an awful position to kind of enforce this situation and, and also deal with kids that really are in distress and maybe do need to be removed from situations that are not safe, but at a rate that just can't be something is wrong with that's that being our solution it seems to me I'm wondering if like I I always imagine like there could be a solution involving like care for the whole family instead of a child being removed from a situation that's unhealthy and I'm wondering if that's something that is recognized within indigenous medicine or within like healing centers some kind of sense of like the family being what needs to have a care worker helping them versus the kid needing to be removed yeah exactly and that you know exactly and that speaks to the nature of intergenerational trauma right you taking them out at each generation is not going to address the problems um, and so that's exactly what Cindy Blackstock it, talks about is these kind of holistic pr approaches that at attack the, these issues at all different sides and so I'd, ad I'd uh, recommend reading some of her stuff specifically related to the child welfare uh, system yes that the tribunal that Cindy Blackstock has been working for, is that coming up? Yeah, so the decision is expected within the next two weeks. By before the end of January, the decision is supposed to be expected. So that's something that everybody's kind of really listening for closely. Yeah. Yes? I, I don't know if it's a question or a comment. But, um, <clears throat> so there are three generations of people of First Nations who are who have been in residential schools. So that must mean that for a lot of the reserves, not only are the families dysfunctional, but the reserves must be dysfunctional. Is there uh, any way that people are talking about or thinking about going <coughs> back to your social work, you know, we're wanting to help the family, but you need to help the reserves. Yeah. Um, because there must not be that many elders left anymore that know the traditional medicine and how, the, you know, how they lived off the land. <coughs> yeah, absolutely, and that is uh, an issue, um, and that's going to vary a lot between different communities and, and, and vary according to their histories. You know, some. Some communities absolutely have thriving um, elders, but then others, that is a major problem that a lot of communities are facing, uh, not only with traditional knowledge, but with language and, and all of these other things. Um, and so, you know, a lot of communities are right now trying, doing all sorts of different unique community-based interventions to, uh, to address that specific issue, but it's a really hard one. Um, you know, when with culture change and the youth having different experiences and different, 
there's no real easy answer and I think it, it'll, it, it also differs a lot across different communities. In some communities that I go to, um, you know, they're really, there's a real kind of change to go back to uh, traditional ways, but then some other communities I work in, uh, they're very a religious Christian community and so you can't, you can't, the answer is not just, it's a bit more complicated and so, and I think that's why there's not just a one answer statement for all communities and it's, it's complicated. I know I lived in Vancouver for a while, so a lot of the BC uh, reservations are quite well off. Mm -hmm. Whereas some of the northern ones in Manitoba or Ontario, who back or not. Yeah. So with the housing and all of the water and all of those issues. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that's you know I think why why it makes it so people would just like well what's what's the answer? But there's not a one blanket answer, and it's really complicated. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm curious to hear you talk about what's going on with um, just our data, you know, our access to data, and you've obviously been very instrumental in developing the picture we have of health disparities, and I think we might assume we live in a data-driven world that you push buttons and it comes out, and it doesn't for health yeah, right. in Canada in general and for Aboriginal health, so where are we at and what big structural changes could happen to make that data more available within the process? Yeah, uh, it's a bit, it's like, yeah, a complicated one. Um, I, I was just saying at the beginning, so I just started working on a report for the TRC to present on disparities over the years, and it was, I was just blown away that no one tracks that and no one does that. Um, and so there's definitely major problems. Um, you know, I had to go to different, there's a national one, there's a national uh, surveys for First Nations on reserve that are run by a First Nations organization. Um, but then, other than that, all of the Statistics Canada stuff doesn't cover on reserve, so they don't have as much data. Other issues is that f for the national data off reserve, they have a lot of data coverage, qual uh, coverage issues um, and uh, issues related to self-identification and all of this, and so it's the accuracy of the data related to Indigenous peoples is also not, we're not really sure. Because um, the what we do know is the amount of Indigenous peoples who have started identifying in national data sets have, has increased significantly over the past, I think, 20 years, uh, greater than the, po the even possible po uh, population growth. So more people are self-identifying, and we don't. So there's all those issues that are going to play into it too, and it's. So data coverage and quality is something we need to improve, and then also just tracking it. Um, so you noted that you know, communities have different <coughs> rates of health disparities, and you noted at the end that there were you know, things that seemed to be correlated with resilience. So I'm wondering if in your work, working with different communities, if there are other things sort of, other than a greater sense of cultural pride and identity that have been correlated with greater resilience in those communities where the health disparities are, are lesser or even better than national averages on certain things. Um, I would say we, we really focused on, on cultural identity in our research, but you know there's other other research that uh, was done specifically in in First Nations communities in BC, and they looked at suicide rates in youth, and they found that um, they used the term cultural continuity, and I'm not sure if that actu actu accurately describes what they were measuring. They were measuring uh, they looked at the number of uh, uh, self-run organizations and kind of uh, things that they were able to offer in their community like their own fire department, their own, uh, the number, I think it, one of the measures was the number of women in their chief and council. And so they had all these measures of just community, uh, community resilience measures and that seemed to be related to youth suicide. And so there's these, and, and so those were, I, I know I'm not giving you specific examples because I can't remember them, but they were like systemic um, issues that the community, you know, would provide good services, uh, cultural services, and all of these culturally based things. So, it, I think a lot of the focus has been on culture uh, and how that acts as a resilience factor. But I mean, of course, all of the other factors that are relevant to non-indigenous populations are just going to be as just as important, like addressing the childhood adversity, addressing all of those things. So, I think we still have a lot of research to do to find out, to find what are the, the, the solutions and how that varies across different communities.
Yes. Um, I'm a First Nations social worker and I'm doing my master's right now. Um, and I'm trying to focus as much of my degree on Indigenous seniors' health. And I'm having a hard time finding any research, any data that kind of speaks to the long term care units that are available on reserve. Mm -hmm. I think it might even be less than 1%. Um, so I'm just wondering if you'd be able to like kind of point me in the right direction or if there's any resources that you are aware of that may help me. I'm not aware of any long, any, I think, you know, there's a lot of issues that there's just a lack of, of information out there. So that's a good thing for you to get, to keep going on, I guess. <laughs> just related to that, I'm aware of one in Northwestern BC, okay. in Hazleton. Okay. So you might be able to, it's part of their local hospital. Oh, awesome. Yeah, okay. But it is on reserve. Okay, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> There's one, there's also one in the Saginaw Reserve in Manitoba. Okay. Yes. I have a comment about it. Uh, a couple of comments actually that relates to some of our health issues that we're looking at. I'm John, and I do a lot of health policy and research, and I work with Mark at the IWK. When we're looking at any of the health determinants of health, for example, and any of the social determinants that relate to health, um, I think a lot of the movement is going towards not the dysfunctional side of what the Aboriginal policies are not working or are working, or the lack of budget or lack of funds, for example, for developing any of this stuff. I think what we're trying to do now is move towards building those partnerships and research, of course, to look at how we're going to uh, put that information back up there. So this whole IRS thing, I know for a lot of people here it's very new. And, and a lot of people that live this, more than three generations, four generations, that are going to be dealing with this for the next few generations, um, it's, it's something not new at all, but frustrating. When you spin your wheels in these communities, <coughs> trying to develop policies with very little funding and very little um, outward policy support, for example, from pro province or from uh, federal government. I think one of the big things that in Atlantic, region we're trying to look at from a First Nations perspective or a Mi'kmaq perspective here in, in Nova Scotia is to make sure that we go towards legal matters and jurisdictions and responsibilities, responsibilities. And it's not about who is responsible for that particular jurisdiction legally. Um, it's, a, it's a responsibility that we all have to assume. So, but we don't have those resources and we have to reach out for those resources or build those resources. There are communities in this province that are really well off, um, and others that are disparately the opposite. So we have to look at balancing, balancing that out somehow. And the big challenge is uh, the public. The public and not know the educational system, the post-secondary education system, and trying to put content out there that's more Aboriginal focused. Uh, or anything that had to do with humanities, for example. So Dalhousie, over the last um, eight years that I've seen building this content, has done tremendous effort. That's why we're here. Otherwise, five years ago, you wouldn't have seen these types of topics, or 10 years ago. So there's a lot more public support now because of education and because of these legal matters. And that's the only way we could carve out this process. It's a longer process. Somebody mentioned social work, for example. Um, there's health, there's um, education. All of these areas, we have to scrape at every single area. We can't just go at the education and health. We have to go at policy people. There's somebody here from one of our communities that is a uh, leadership uh, responsibility. Then we have to look at, for example, anything that has to do with trees. We have to revisit every single document up there. And a lot of it is, is uh, it's plain scrap and it's trying to make the pieces work for everybody. And it's very challenging, but for a positive person and positive people here, um, it's changing quite a bit. And this whole government thing about recognition, for example, for the IRS and the recommendations and then looking at the UN Declaration of Indigenous Rights, it, public policy and public people are the ones that voted for this. So we're moving forward with that. And that change in tide, I think, is what's going to make a difference. Um, and people like yourself being in the academia. Um, 
Um, but it's a long process still that we won't see um, make it better or improve it for another three generations. So it's a long, long road, but it, it, there's hope up there at least. And there's a lot of research. And that's the only way we can do it, build a partnership out there. Otherwise, we'll be still spinning our wheels. And um, we'll see what happens. We're hopeful. Agreed. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Questions or comments? No, so please uh, just join me in uh, thanking you.